Okay, I am going to be reading an excerpt here from Doom the Tomb of Sarna. If anyone is not familiar with it, it is the story of this wondrous city called Sarna. Now the thing is, it had stood by the ancient city of Ib, which was inhabited by water lizards, and the people of Sarna murdered the entire the entirety of the inhabitants and were subsequently warned of the threat of doom. So here we shall pick it up. Each year there was celebrated in Sarna the feast of the destroying of Ib, at which time wine, sora, song, dancing, and merriment of every kind abounded. Great honors were then paid to the shades of those who had annihilated the odd ancient beings, and the memory of those beings and of their elder gods was derided by dancers and lutenists crowned with roses from the gardens of Zophar. And the kings would look out over the lake and curse the bones of the dead that lay beneath them. At first the high priests liked not these festivals, for there had descended amongst them queer tales of how the sea green icon had vanished, and how Taranish had died from fear and left the morning. And they said that from their high tower they sometimes saw lights beneath the waters of the lake. But as many years passed without calamity, even the priests laughed and cursed and joined in the orgies of the feasters. Indeed, had they not themselves in their high tower often performed the very ancient and secret rite in detestation of Bakra, the water lizard. And a thousand years of riches and delight passed over Sarna, wonder of the world. Gorgeous beyond thought was the feast of the thousands, thousands year of the destroying of Ilk. For a decade had it been talked of in the land of Minar, and as it drew nigh there came to Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, men from Thra, Ilarnak, and Kadatharon, and all the cities of Minar and the lands beyond. Before the marble walls on the appointed night were pitched the pavilions of princes and the tents of travelers. Within his banquet hall reclined Nargis High, the king, drunk with ancient wine from the vaults of conquered Penoth, and surrounded by feasting nobles and hurrying slaves. There were eaten many strange delicacies at that feast. Peacocks from the distant hills of Imphan, heels of camels from the Benazic Desert, nuts and spices from Sidaphrian groves, and pearls from wave-washed metal dissolved in the vinegar of the rock. Of sauces there were an untold number, prepared by the subtlest cooks in all Minar, and suited to the palate of every feaster. But most prized of all the viands were the great dishes from the lake, east of Das size, and served upon golden platters set with rubies and diamonds. Whilst the king and his nobles feasted within the palace and viewed the crowning dish as it awaited them on golden platters, others feasted elsewhere. In the tower of the great temples the priests held revels, and in pavilions without the walls the princes of neighboring lands made merry. And it was the high priest Ganai Ka who first saw the shadows that descended from the gibbous moon into the lake, and the damnable green mists that arose from the lake to meet the moon, and to shroud in a sinister haze the towers and the domes of David's heart. Thereafter, those in the towers and without the walls beheld strange lights on the water, and saw that the gray rock of Hurrian, which was wont to rear high above it near the shore, was almost submerged. And fear grew vaguely yet swiftly, so that the princes of Ilarnik and of Far Recall took down and folded their tents and pavilions and departed, though they scarce knew the reason for their departing. Then, close to the hour of midnight, all the bronze gates of Sarna burst open, and emptied forth a frenzied throng that blackened the plain, so that all the visiting princes and travelers fled away in fright. For on the faces of this throng was writ a madness born of horror unendurable, and on their tongues were words so terrible that no hearer paused for proof. Men whose eyes were wild with fear shrieked aloud at the sight within the king's banquet hall, where through the windows were seen no longer the forms of Nargis High and his nobles and slaves, but a horde of indescribable green voiceless things with bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips and curious ears, things which danced horribly, bearing in their paws golden platters set with rubies and diamonds and containing uncouth flames. And the princes and travelers, as they fled from the doomed city of Sarna, on horses and camels and elephants, looked again upon the mist beginning lake and saw the gray rock of Hurrian was quite submerged. Through all the land of Minar and the land adjacent spread the tales of those who had fled from Sarna, and Caragon sought that accursed city and its precious metals in the And it was long ere any travelers went thither, and even then only the brave and adventurous young men of yellow hair and blue eyes, who were no kin to the men of Minar. These men indeed went to the lake to view Sarna, but though they found the vast still lake itself, 
and the gray rock of Hurrian, which rears high above it near the shore, they beheld not the wonder and pride of all mankind. Where once had risen walls of three hundred cubits and towers yet higher, now stretched only the marshy shore, and where once had dwelt fifty million of men, now crawled the detestable waters. Not even the mines of, me of precious metal remained. Doom had come to Sarn. But half buried in the rushes, we spied a curious green idol, an exceedingly ancient idol chiseled in the likeness of Bakra, the great water lizard. That idol, enshrined in the high temple at Awarna, was subsequently worshipped beneath the gibbous moon throughout the land. We now have an offering from yes. Mr. Brett Rutherford, if he would come forward, please. And what delights have you brought us today, Brett? Uh, something gentle and something nasty. Uh, something <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm starting with a fragment first. Thinking of Lovecraft on the great train ride returning home from his two year sojourn in New York, wondering how he would be received back in his hometown. Home is that place if you go there. They have to turn you away. Your name is one they say they can't remember. Graven in stone as it is in the churchyard. Your greeting, the glance averted, or the twitching hand that averts the evil eye. Each corner, a possible turn into the waiting crowd, torches and pitchforks ready. <laughs> in Providence, there are three extant houses in which Lovecraft lived. <clears throat> not one of them looks haunted. Not one of them looks like tentacles might come out of the windows. <laughs> and it prompted me to think about whether it is the architecture of the attic in the house or whether it's the architecture of the mind that creates the haunting. This is called something there is in the attic. Every human body is a haunted house. Something there is in the attic that drives it and sets its course. Are the shutters half drawn? Are they nailed against sunrise? Do spiders spin in the tenantless rooms? Who lives there? Ahab and his mono movie madness? Emily with her dry leaf columns like money under a bed? Or no one at all? Does no one hear as each flake shingle falls, as varicose ivy beards up, as sun and sag gray wash the porch beams and lintels? Something there is in the attic that drives it and sets its course. Whose will? An old man's will? A boy's? A loudmouth betrayer of dreams? A dreamer paralyzed? Why does this house not fall, standing at Elmwood Avenue, accusing all, begging a moon, a clean sweep, a neighbor's knock, a lender? Something there is in the attic that drives it and sets its course. This house is Ahab's ship, <coughs> Usher's man's, Lovecraft's infirmary, a witch house, peaceful love nest, and chapel, sanctum of solitude, the Capulet's tomb. If every body is a, if every human body is a haunted house, shall we not choose these ghosts? Can I not summon a typing poltergeist, a coloratura howler, a raconteur to teach me all dead languages, a gourmet chef, insomniac, someone for whom the 18th floor overture has not, as for me, ever lost its charm, a friend who hover over his Batman comics and knows every line poor Bella Lugosi was ever made to utter, room enough and beds and food and tea for them all. In October, this house is avalanche as leaves and ghosts of leaves from every tree that ever crisped in the tug between slant sun and frost pile high 
in ziggurats of oak, maple and sumac, hawthorn and willow, each with a tale of hope and sorrow. They almost obscure the house, so high that one lone cupola, the poet's watch, stands apex at its pyramid as one mad vein whirls at the whim of indecisive winds as lightning rod trembles for discharge of the weighted sky into the attic hunter's cranium. I am that attic something. I drive this house unchanging, wall to wall with mad cargo. My gamble roof is an upside down Mayflower. I sail against the leaf tide. Monsters would block my packing at passage. Great whales of doubt breach above a maple current, a baleful skyward eye, and tentacles of the giant squid of loneliness float by in a sea tide of weeping willow. Yet something there is in the attic that billows the sails and drives me on. The madness that fills these pages is self-sustaining. Some days these scratchings seem meaningless, unmusical. Some days I read and gasp and shudder to think that somehow I wrote or was written through to reach this apogee alone. Well, lacking the guests I crave, I must split and become them. Books, cat, and bed, a galaxy of music, teapot that fills as fast as I empty it. It is not a bad life to be the haunter of one's cobweb self.